always good to be here on Sunday. and I get to see my friends that I'll spend eternity with. Um, get to sing a little bit. That's always an encouragement. Let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of John. We're going through a series of chapters that uh, is the last few days of Jesus's, or right before his arrest and crucifixion. We started off with John chapter 14, uh, verse 1, where Jesus sets the overarching goal that he had for the apostles and eventually for us as we follow him. He said in John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. And then after that, he gives them reason after reason after reason for hearts not to be troubled, regardless of what the condition or situation of our life may be. We have made it today to John chapter 15, and we're going to pick up reading in verse 12. Now, I want to remind you again that this is not just the word of God. When we read this text, we are hearing the voice of Jesus himself. So let's read what Jesus so told the apostles from John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. As I have been looking and studying this passage of Scripture, I have decided to, uh, I think, I'm going to have to do some more prayer on it, but I have decided to look at the bookends first and then address what goes inside the bookends. Okay? And I want you to look at what Jesus says here because in 12 and also in 17, he talks about love. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I first thought of this, I thought, well, you know, you know that's, that's redundant. But the more that I began studying, praying, reading, reflecting, and writing, the more I came to the conclusion that I needed this message myself. And I hope that you will find some encouragement in it. The word love in these two verses is the Greek word, the Greek root word agape. Now, you know that for Greeks, they had several different words for love. One is agape, which means unconditional love. There was phileo, which is brotherly love. And then there was eros, which, was, which is physical love. And what we are looking at when we talk about unconditional love, agape love, is that you can almost describe it as a love in spite of. In other words, the kind of love that Jesus is talking about here is the kind of love that we are, have, are to have for people in spite of what happens. The world, they don't have that kind of love. You don't do what they want. They don't care. They never loved you to begin with. Uh, they will say they love you as long as you provide what they want. But that is not the kind of love that Jesus is talking about here. Agape love is a sacrificial love on the part of the person that is doing the loving. Sacrificial love begins in the heart and flows from there. Sacrificial love re continues regardless of what the object of love says or does. Just listen. 
Acts chapter 2, verses 42, 44 through 45. Acts 2. I, because what I want you to see is what love looks like. Because we're going to describe love as action. That's going to be one of our definitions. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 44, it's written, And all who believed. How many is that? That's all of them. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. 45 gets tough, guys. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So if there was someone who was part of the fellowship and they had a need and there was a family that didn't have the, the liquid cash, they would sell off part of their land or maybe a couple of cows or whatever so that they could provide what the person needed. Now, don't think that this passage talks about Christian socialism, that everybody gets together and everybody is equal with everything they've got. Because if you will remember, in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, if anyone is not willing to work, finish it for me. Don't let him eat. So that's what we need to be careful away from. But this is not what is happening. Them selling their possessions and giving to those who had need was because of the cross. Jesus' sacrificial love for them changed them from the inside out. It was a natural thing for them to love others because of the depth of the love that Jesus had for them. Now notice I said natural. It's not something that anybody had to be told to do or guilted to do. It was something that somebody just did, kind of like uh, Zacchaeus. You remember that once he, when he came down from the tree, he started, you know, making everything right with people that he had stole from. Jesus didn't tell him to do that. It came natural as part of the heart. Now listen, to a great degree, the people of God do not need to be told by some loudmouth preacher about what you ought to be doing or how you ought to be living. Do you know why? It should come natural. It should come natural for all of us as we see and read the scripture. And I'll tell you, I'll guarantee you it has happened with every one of us multiple times. Because we see somebody in need and the Holy Spirit prompts us. And by the way, he doesn't always yell. Most of the time he whispers. And he says, hey, Ron, You've got three belts. You only can fit in two. <laughs> Why did you laugh, Joel? <laughs> you got three belts? Okay. You fit in all of them? Yeah, okay. Well, but there are times when the Holy Spirit will prompt us and we will rationalize it away. How do I know that? Because I've done it. And so I'm suggesting that what we need to do is to be more sensitive to the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit because that's what happened there. The Holy Spirit prompted them, hey, you've got an extra, you've got a back 40 you're not using or you have a back 40 you are using, but look what they need. And then their love that Christ showed them continued through their love to encourage and help others. I also thought of the human perspective of a mother's love for a child. A mother never quits loving her child. Am I right? Her heart may be crushed, but her love, if anything, will grow stronger. You've heard this quote. A mother is only as happy as her least happy child. I thought also, I couldn't let dads out of it. It's not like we're a bunch of meanies or anything. But I thought back also to the prodigal son's dad from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. You remember that the youngest son demanded his inheritance. And what he was actually saying is, you're not dying quick enough. I want mine now, which had to be very hurtful to the dad. But what did the dad do? He gave it to him and let him go. And listen, love does what is best for the object that is loved. That dad knew his son. And he knew the best thing that could happen to him 
would be what most parents would decide is the worst thing that they could endure. But he gave him his inheritance. He let him go. His son left home. He lived a debauched life, and he ended up living and eating with pigs. And when he came to himself, the scripture says, which is really another term for repenting. I mean, he's sitting there. He's eating literally with pigs, and, and he says, the servants in my dad's house have it better than this. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and say, Dad, can I just be one of your hired servants? So he starts back, and it's so interesting to me how it's written. It says the dad sees him from a long way off. It's probably because he could smell him from that far off. And what does it say the dad did? He ran to him, which was breaking all the social conventions of the day for, for a, a a patriarch to run, but he ran to him. And when he got to him, he didn't spray him down with Lysol. He didn't wash him off with a hose. What did he do? He hugged him and he kissed him. He took him back home. And the kid said, hey, just let me be a servant. He said, hush. He took him back home, cleaned him up, gave him a new robe, gave him a gold ring, killed the fatted calf. And he said, my son, which was lost, now is found. But keep in mind, there was that repentance factor that was in there. The father's love never wavered, even in the midst of heartbreak. He took him back because of his son's repentance. It was obvious. I like that the father didn't guilt him. How many of us, and it's not because my mom's not here. My mom never did this. But I have talked to many, many people over the years who one or both parents guilted them into doing the things that they did or did not think they should do. Dad didn't do that here. He loved him unconditionally. And it showed. Now, I do want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, we're, we're trying to get to a good definition of love where Jesus says, I command you to love others as I have loved you. And so what we're trying to do is get ourselves a, 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 a point of reference for what kind, what love is, what it looks like, and how it happens. And, and this, this is where, honestly, this whole message, I just kind of got yanked around, but that's okay. Y'all are going to get to do it now. I'm going to tell you, I'm reading from a different translation even than I read from. Because there's one phrase in it that I absolutely love the way they translated it. I'm reading from the NIV. Now, it's the love passage. And just let me say, that's not a wedding passage. This is not about weddings. It's okay to read them at weddings. It's a good thing to read them at weddings. But what Paul is writing is not about a wedding. He's talking about love from God and also the way it looks in us. Let's read Love is, I gotta stop. That word is right there is the Greek verb that means continuation. In other words, it means that love keeps on being, is the idea. Love is patient. Let's use the old, let's use the little thing. That, love keeps on being kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And here's the phrase I like the most. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And that word fail there means to means that it never ends, nor can it be destroyed. This is the kind of love that Jesus Christ had slash has toward his children. And because we are to be more like Christ, guess what? This is the description of the kind of love or what love looks like in our own lives with those around us, with those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, and yes, including our blood family. I have, a, 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 I have some blood family members right now that because of 
because of my dad, there's bad blood. Boy, I didn't know I was going to end up saying that. But they don't want to have a whole lot to do with me and my family. And every time mom and I have reached out, we've been, you know, but, but so I, I'm tell, what I'm saying is, is that love doesn't quit. We still love people, even though there's difficulties within family issues. At this point in preparation, after reading the 1 Corinthians 13 passage, I had to slow way down. I had to take a couple of days and, and let that settle in. I had to do some serious evaluation. To be honest with you, I'm still doing it and trying to figure it out in some areas. I will tell you this. A good friend of mine told me. I told him, I said, look, you know, I'm reading this about love and what I'm coming to. And I said, man, I, I, I feel helpless. I mean, I'm, I, there's no way. I, I will fail. I'm a failure at this, and I will fail at it. And he made an excellent, excellent point. He said, Ron, the only way that this can be approached, that we can get better at, that we can become, is through the presence and the indwelling and work of the Holy Spirit. That means that we, remember we've talked before about being more loving, more forgiving, more merciful. It's the idea of us growing into this. And that, that, that helps me and helped me feel a lot better. And then I read Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 because it gave me some encouragement and strength. First, it was a little bit slippery, but in the end, it was solid ground. Paul wrote, he said, let all now, how many times have we asked that question? How much is all? It's everything. All, every bit of it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slight slander be put away from you along with all malice. Do any of us here have any degree of a grudge towards somebody else maybe that we haven't even told people about. The only reason I bring that up is because the Holy Spirit gave me a name. And I'm not, I'm trying, trying. I'm afraid he's going to give me three or four. But I mean, look at what he is saying here. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be, it's that word again. Keep on being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And look at the last phrase. What is it? As God in Christ forgave you, and he forgave us because of his love. So what is the foundation for me forgiving and loving and showing mercy? It's because of what Jesus did on my behalf. He doesn't hold grudges against me. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now what? No, no condemnation. Well, if there is no condemnation between me and God, how dare I hold a grudge to anybody on this earth? I killed God's son. How dare, and he forgave me. How dare I be so arrogant as to not forgive someone else. So, I look at that phrase. You know, all of a sudden, the rest of Ephesians just kind of melted. And there was only one verse in Ephesians that I could see. And it was only part of the 32nd verse. As God in Christ forgave you. <coughs> With that being the case, I want you to hear how God's love is described from Psalm 103. Now remember, the reason I'm saying this thing is for us to, to understand the depth and degree to which God has love for us. I, 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 hope, I'm, I hope you're hearing the good part, that, that, that God loves us this much. In Psalm 103, there are two, two verses that you, you quoted, you, you know them, but I want you to see the depth of, and the effect of God's love towards us. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
so great is his steadfast love toward those who feel who fear him. Have y'all kept up with the James Webb uh, telescope? It sees further and further and further than Hubble ever did. And you know what we have not found? The end of the universe. So, so put in your mind, let's, let's make this uh, as concrete as we can. You, you take the earth, where we're standing right now, go out and look as far as you can, which means you cannot see to the end of infinity. And the scripture says here is that is the amount of love that God has for us. It's never ending. It's all encompassing. It's huge. It's dynamic. It's there. It cannot be. You can't overwhelm it. God's love overwhelms us. Look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's the forgiveness element. And we've talked about the globe before, right? If you're at the equator and you start going east on the globe, how long will you go east? You will keep going east the rest of your life. There is no east and then it turns into west like there's a north and then it begins to come south. Which, by the way, God is saying this is a globe. Where you live is a globe. It's not flat or all those other things here. So what we do now is we go back to John 15. Because I want us to take all that about what love is like, the depth and degree to which God loves us, what the effect is on our life, and how we are to keep on growing in our love. And we get back to John chapter 15, now that we are getting a little bit better definition of what love is, and let's look at Jesus' words again. 12 and 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No pressure, by the way. No pressure. These things I have commanded you so that you will love one another. This is actually a restatement from John 13. Don't turn there. But in verse 34 and 35, Jesus says there, a new commandment I give you to love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples. If you have love, one for another. In John chapter 15, 12 and 13, with chapter 13, verse 34, which we have just looked at, we are getting a concept and an idea about the, the importance of love on earth because of the love that God showed towards us through his son who came to earth and he has loved us absolutely unconditionally. Has anybody sinned since they got saved? Yeah. Have we sinned bad? Well, one, one is enough. It's bad. And we're forgiven. By the way, how many of our sins are forgiven? Do you remember? Past, present, and what? Future. Future. So how am I to love my brothers and sisters in Christ and those around me? Yeah, you messed up, but I'm not going to keep a record of wrongs. Yeah, you're not doing it right right now, but I'm going to still love you. And you know what? You'll probably mess up in the future, and I'm going to forgive you then because that's the way God loves us. That's the way he loves me. And when he says this, that we are to live and we're to love as he did, he loved to the point of dying physically, the point of death. And, and then this is how my, my brain thinks. Who will I die for? Who will I sacrifice my time, my money, my energy? Yes, my life for. I will tell you this. God's first, family second, church is third. There is a hierarchy in there, okay? I don't want it to, to settle in a way that, that gets you discombobulated, but, but there is a, a hierarchy. In other words, if it boiled down to someone in the congregation or my, my family, I hope you don't get mad at me, but my family's going to come before anybody else. 
Now, God gives me a word, and I do mean a word, and, and, and yeah, I'm going to go with him first. I'll give you the for instance would be if I was, uh, God forbid, God forbid, was uh, uh, arrested and I was told you either deny Christ as your Savior or will kill your family. At that point, I've got to say I'm sorry, Christ is first. And I think my family would understand that. Because see, here's where I know. They're about to see Jesus before me, and that gets me jealous of them. So we have to understand the nuances of this love, but I would suggest if you're like me, we still have a long way to go to be loving and start loving more like Jesus says. When Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, I couldn't help but think of that mathematical formula. Do y'all remember the forgiveness mathematical formula? 70 times 7. So on the 491st time, we can do what we want, right? No, that's not the point Jesus was making. But he does say that we are to keep on forgiving. Why? Why are we supposed to love each other? In that little phrase that Jesus said, he says, By this all men will know you are my disciples, by your love one for another. Is it any wonder that there are people that will not, that will not grace a congregational meeting because of how they have seen Christians treat each other? I will every and listen, every church I've been in, without exception, I had people that I would visit on the behalf of the congregation, and they'd say, every congregation, as long as so and so or such and such family is going, there's no way I will because. And then they lay it out for me. And I can't say anything. They've even talked about how people treated each other within a congregation. They said, I don't want to go there. Listen. People, when they come to church, can I tell you what they want? Number one, they want to encounter God. And number two, they want peace. They don't want to come to a Baptist deacon business meeting where there's nothing but fussing and griping and complaining. That one was free. I just wanted to throw it out there. Okay. What I do know is that conduct over time glorifies God, which means... That as we love one another, doesn't mean we won't get hurt. Doesn't mean we won't get offended. Doesn't mean we won't say something stupid. I don't know if y'all remember this, but when I first came here, I said, there are time, there's going to be a time where I'm going to say something I shouldn't say. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to make a mistake. And so are you. And what we're going to do is work it out, and we're going to stay together as a fellowship. Now, I don't know. I can't do anything about anybody else, but that's been and has been and will be my goal. Now, man, I just know I'm skipping a lot of stuff. Say thank you, Ron. I'm going to skip to my conclusion. I know this is going to be, I know this is going to kind of be, um, it's going to kind of be uh, really odd. In other words, there's not a transition. What I'm trying to do right now is to make a transition into the last part of the message. So what do we do? With all this, what do we do? I wrote these down this morning. First thing we all have to do, I'm including myself, we must repent and confess to God that we don't love as we should. Second, we must ask God to help us love as he's commanded, because it is not possible without him. That's the Philippians 1, 6, 2, 13. You can go read it later. Third, I must consciously follow Jesus' command, God's will and the Spirit's work, to love because I know they will lead and give me the desire and strength to put love into action. That is 2 Peter 1, 3 through 5, and also 7 and 8. Last. <clears throat> Don't ignore the Spirit's whisper. It may have happened already in here. It may happen as you're driving home. It may happen this week where the Holy Spirit whispers in your ear about love and forgiveness and restoration. 
Don't ignore the Spirit. Don't ignore the Spirit. And in whatever way He leads you to do, then do. And, and those are the four things that I'm going to be trying to do myself this week. And I'm not going to tell you all about them because it's none of your business. And I don't want to know yours. I can kind of help you or I don't want to know particulars. I don't want to know names. I'll be glad to help you and encourage you, pray for you, all those things. But I want us all to show love like Christ loved us more and more and more. Amen. Let's, let's work on that. Asking God to help us. Father, I, I hope this message has, has accomplished what you wanted to have accomplished. I pray that you will help all of us to understand the great depth to which you love us and that it will so settle into our lives that we can't help but love others. I do ask completely and overwhelmingly for your, for your guidance, your Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and discernment so that we are not fools in our loving, but that we are, are godly in the things that we do. And so, Father, we rest and rely upon you. I ask for your encouragement and your blessing upon each person here today and their families as we come to this time of invitation. Of course, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. What number? 922. 922. Let's all stand. Thank you.